So now in this final video, we're going to be concluding our look at the skeleton by looking at how the human skeleton is shaped and formed. The human skeleton possesses greater than 200 bones. So we have a lot of muscles attached to those bones in order to promote the overall uh, function of movement. And in addition, 200 bones are going to function in protection and overall are going to give you this human skeleton. Some of these bones are going to actually be fused together. Some bones are fused together, and this is usually going to happen during uh, the organogenesis of an embryo, developing embryo. And in addition, those 200 bones sometimes may be connected to each other. Others are connected at the joints. So whenever a bone, a bone is connected to another bone, this is happening at a joint. And this joint connection, a bone to bone, is via ligaments. So I want to make something a little bit uh, very clear, I should say. Tendons are going to connect bone to muscle. Ligaments are going to connect bone to bone. Okay, make sure you have that distinction very, very clear. And this is going to happen at a joint. Now, what's the purpose of this? Why would you want to connect bone to bone? Well, first of all, this is going to occur at the joint. It's worth understanding what a joint's purpose is. A joint is a junction, or will be junctions, between two or more bones. And so in order to connect them, you're going to use a ligament. This is overall going to be done in an attempt to have flexibility. This allows flexibility. It allows you not to be very stiff, but rather be flexible and allows for complex movements. Okay? This is what allows you to play sports, to walk successfully and correctly, to write something intricate. To write this letter A involves a lot of successful muscles and bones working synergistically, nice term to use there, for the flexibility and movement necessary to do something as simple as writing a letter A. So that's our human skeleton. And then finally, I sort of want to put a dividing line here. Um, one last thing that's covered in this lecture is the types of locomotion that are seen as a result of a skeleton. Because remember, skeleton is useful for protection, yes, for support, yes, but also for movement. And the fancy way of saying movement when studying biology is locomotion. So let's just quickly look at the ways that locomotion happens. Locomotion is just active travel. This is what allows organisms to move from point A to point B. Active travel can occur on land, and it does occur on land. And if it's occurring on land, the skeleton will be utilized to run, it will be utilized to hop, to jump, to walk. You get the picture. These are all events that occur only on land. You can't really do these things on water or in the air. So in order to do this, you need to utilize a skeleton. But these things are all going to actually be occurring against gravity. So the animal that's on land, that's trying to move on land, must be able to support itself. Must be able to support itself against gravity. Because on land you are facing gravity, and so you have to be able to stand upright. And therefore, as a kid, as a toddler, we're trying to fight this force of gravity that has kept us crawling on the ground and finally reached to the point of walking, right? That process is difficult for us because this is the first time in our very young toddler lives we're fighting gravity on our own and trying to balance our skeleton and muscles in such an intricate way that we can do something as simple as walking. So I think that's very important here overall. In order to do this movement against gravity, we not only utilize the skeleton, but we simultaneously um, use muscles as well. Use muscles and those muscles provide force. And the force that we want to use here, the term here is propulsion. That allows us to basically go towards whatever area that we want to get to. At point A to point B, we, propo we propel ourselves there um, via running, hopping, jumping, walking, whatever it may be on land. Okay, so that's the story on land. That's how we move on land. But there are organisms that don't move on land. There are organisms that move in the water. So what about them? How do they utilize locomotion? Well, first of all, in water, gravity is not a problem because there is no gravity underwater. It's just basic sort of uh, uh, physics that we have here. The gravity at this time is not influential enough for a sort of force that we have to fight against if you're a water-dwelling organism. 
So it's not a big problem here because what you do instead is use buoyancy, okay? So you use this capability of floating because floating is, cap is only possible underwater because gravity itself is not a problem. So you use buoyancy to utilize or to promote active travel or locomotion. But one problem that you do have underwater is not gravity, let's say, but it is friction. Because sometimes when you're float or when you're trying to push yourself, propel yourself, use propulsion through water, you have to make sure that you're propelling yourself in a very um, a systematic way. There's going to be sort of a force from the water that's going to push back against you. Um, if you have a very sort of frictionful environment or surface without getting into much physics. Simply speaking, in order to def defeat the friction that may be underneath water, if you don't have a very nice uh, gliding capability underwater, your solution to this would be to have a streamlined organism. So when you look at any organism that is underwater, what you notice is that they usually have a very pointed nose and a very sort of um, triangular view, triangular sort of shape to them, that's all to streamline and avoid any sort of friction when moving underwater to promote very smooth and efficient movement. Finally, you can travel by land, by water, and you can also travel by air, of course. Air travel is possible by organisms because organisms will use their respective wings to fly. And if you use your wings to fly, you do have a problem. Your problem is gravity. You have to go against gravity. So let's look at the problem here again. There's always a problem with movement. It doesn't just happen. You have to fight gravity, just like the land-dwelling organisms. But there are two very nice solutions to this if you are somebody, some organism that can fly. Solution one. Solution number one. What do you do? What you do is you have wings. And these wings have evolved over millions and millions of years. So these organisms that use air travel have evolved wings that generate. That means that there's definitely muscles here that are stuck to those bones. Evolved wings that generate enough lift. The key word here is lift to overcome gravity's downward force. So we're not going to get into any physics here, but gravity is something you have to fight against. So you use the wings to generate enough lift to overcome, I should write overcome here, overcome gravity's downward force. Okay, so gravity is always going downward and you're trying to beat that. How do you beat that? You use your nice wings. So basically, the shape of the wings, shape of wings is going to be, the term is aerodynamic. That's why we use that term. Planes are aerodynamic. They're able to fight gravity's downward force very nicely through their wings, okay? So aerodynamic structure of an organism will allow them to travel via air. And the other solution is, if you're flying in the air, you're really fighting against gravity, and gravity does not like to have a lot of weight, right? More weight, more problem if you're fighting gravity. So the next solution would be to have a lighter body. And these organisms that fly amazingly do have lighter bodies because, look at this, birds, typically possess no teeth, they have no bladder, so they don't hold any of their uh, urine in a specific structure called the bladder. We'll actually see how they utilize their exc excretory mechanisms when we look at excretion, and also their bones themselves are so highly specialized that they have air-filled regions in their bones. So I encourage you to look up bird interior bone or bird hollow bones. It's amazing to see that their bones are pretty much hollow on the inside except for little pockets of air that allow them to fly so perfectly with their evolved wings and lighter bodies. That covers our look at the musculoskeletal system. Hopefully you can see here that the skeleton and the muscle have to work very nicely together to give you this very important process of movement and something we take for granted of course Hopefully you've gained a greater appreciation for every movement that your body does from this point forward in your life.